Well, hello and welcome to this virtual event in the 2020 Wantage Literary Festival. Uh, my name's Gary Sheffield. I'm a military historian, professor of war studies at the University of Wolverhampton, and most importantly, I'm a resident of Wantage. And I'm really pleased today to welcome Dr. Helen Fry, and we'll be talking about her new book about MI9, in other words, about escape and invasion uh, in Europe in the Second World War. Well, this book is just, uh, just about to be published, in fact, published early next week by Yale University Press. I've read it, I'm very privileged to obviously ha have, have read it in advance, and it's a fascinating book, and it's all sorts of things I'm, I'm keen to talk about with Helen. So, Helen, welcome to Wantage Literary Festival. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Oh, that's great. Well, just to start with a, a bit of bit of background. So first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your expertise and how you came to write this book. So I've spent a number of years researching the story of 10,000 Germans, mainly Jews, who fought for Britain. And of course, quite quickly, you start realising that they get taken up into secret operations and special um, codes and stuff behind enemy lines and so that's where I started really and of course I fell into intelligence studies partly through one of the so-called secret listeners and these are a body of uh, German Jewish refugees who were bugging the conversations of German prisoners of war for a different was, was a branch of MI9 and that really got me going on intelligence stuff because it's just fascinating that whole secret war and then I was asked whether I would write about another part of MI9 history and that's about our airmen and soldiers who were either trapped behind enemy lines or in prisoner of war camps so that's how I came to write the book so I love all things spy espionage secret war Ah, cause, and of course, your, your last book was, was The London Cage, which was very well reviewed. And I must say, again, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, OK, well, let's just start from the beginning. We're, we're, we're talking about MI9 in a minute. You'll have to define exactly what that means. But let's talk about the problem that the, the British faced in the immediate aftermath of Dunkirk. Because up to that point, there were relatively few British servicemen held prisoner. Uh, by the Germans, but after that, large numbers, presumably. Well, yeah, because we always think of the evacuation around Dunkirk as being a huge success, and and it was. You know, three hundred thousand, roughly, Allied personnel. Uh, you know, around three hundred thousand Allied personnel are taken back on small fishing boats to Britain. But I think what people don't realise is fifty thousand were left behind and taken prisoner by the Germans, 5,000 were trapped behind enemy lines and in hiding. So it's a massive problem when we realised that we had all this personnel left behind. Uh, absolutely, and of course I think you make the point uh, that there's nothing really like that in the First World War. I mean, you know, a fair number of people were taken prisoner in the First World War, but not so many in such a short period of time. And so in the aftermath of Dunkirk, so we're talking about, you know, you know, late June, July 1940, clearly there's a new strategic situation which the British have to come to terms with. Uh, and of course, working out what to do about this mass of prisoners um, is part of that. Well, OK, how, do, how does, the, the, does the, the British intelligence services getting involved in it? Because at First blush, you would think it's really a matter of just sending Red Cross parcels and making people uh, sure that these, 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 these prisoners are well fed and the rest of it. How does intelligence come into it? Oh dear, uh, Helen seems to have frozen. Or perhaps it's me. It was me on the philosophy. Prisoners of war can be valuable sources of intelligence. And you're quite right that until, you know, from then until Dunkirk, there were very few uh, prisoners of the Germans. So we realised that we could use prisoners of war, whether they were enemy prisoners of war being treated in special sites here in Britain, or our own soldiers and airmen, they could be number one vital sources of intelligence, but that if they were trapped, and we knew they would be trapped in occupied Europe and in other parts of the war, that we needed them to get back to fight again. Because if you think about it, something, a point I make in the book, 
it, co it costs a lot of money to train an airman and up to three months. So if, if you've, you're losing airmen behind enemy lines, you can't train them quick enough to replace. And of course, air superiority over the Luftwaffe was absolutely, over the German Air Force, was absolutely critical. And so that's why MI9 was formed, to deal with all aspects relating to prisoners of war, whether it's enemy prisoners of war or our prisoners of war. And I think it's worth mentioning here, it's something which I discovered during the writing of the book, it's the philosophy behind this branch of military intelligence that it was coined escape mindedness by the uh, head of MI9, uh, Brigadier Norman Crockett. He was really the brainchild behind the whole organisation and the thought process that we had to get our airmen and soldiers back to fight again, but also to instill in them this sense of what he called escape mindedness, that they must try to escape. Now, um, I suspect that some people watching this won't know very much about the history of escapes and what have you, but they will have seen the film, The Great Escape from the 1960s. And in that, uh, I seem to remember that there's a point they're making, they want to try and create you know, a second front behind, uh, within Germany itself. In other words, if prisoners manage, manage to escape, it ties down large numbers of Germans in, in searching for them, in guarding them and all the rest of it. So it's very much this, 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 this idea that prisoners aren't simply rotting in POW camps, um, but actually they can play an actively res, uh, role as resistors against the Germans. That's, that's what it comes down to, doesn't it, basically? Yeah, it's really not active sabotage or I'm not saying that some of them wouldn't have done that. I mean, there was concern in France, for example, particularly after D-Day, um, Airy Neve, who was one of the most famous escapes from Colditz, um, he was quite concerned that if prisoners, you know, linked up or they could link up with the local resistance and fight, but Norman Crockett, the head of MI9, was more cautious and said, well, you know, you're risking their lives. But on the other hand, so active fighting with resistance groups was, um, there's quite a debate in MI9 about whether that was wise or not. But one of the things they actively encouraged, as you said, was to, well, in very simple terms, just make a nuisance of yourself. Because <laughs> as the MI9 manual and training said, you know, whilst you're, making a nuisance of yourself the guards are busy you know taking care of you and your silliness and not they're one less person in the nazi war machine and so that's why well it's immortalized in a lot of the tv programs but that's why you get a lot of silly basic in it so posing the innocent requests from prisoners but basically they're time wasting and and just giving the germans the run around but nothing nothing malicious, nothing that could really put them into solitary confinement or, or worse. Mm. Okay, right. Well, reading your book, there's a bit of alphabetty soup going on there. <laughs> so you've already talked about MI9, MI6 gets mentioned, various other organisations as well, Room 900, MIS-X. Uh, dash, dash uh, can you try and sort of explain what all these um, letters mean? In, in other words, place MI9 in, 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 in the context, in the organisational context of British intelligence in the Second World yeah. War. Yeah, so MI9 stands for Military Intelligence 9 and it sits within a whole raft of MIs um, from 1 to 19 um, alongside MI5 and MI6 which of course we know much more about but there was a very secret part of MI9 so we've established that MI9 is involved in escape and evasion of our airmen and soldiers but they had a top secret part known as Room 900 also different name it had Room 900 was also known as Intelligence School 9 and that section was involved in dropping well I suppose MI9 you could call it MI9 agents behind enemy lines for special missions it was also involved in intelligence gathering which might be something you want to pick up and chat about shortly so it's a sort of wing within that mis-x is the american version of mi9 and they work very very closely it is basically america's mi9 okay and reading your book there's obviously a fair bit of competition and rivalry between these different organizations um, is, that, is that fair to say? Did it actually get in the way of the war effort? 
Well, that's an interesting discussion, I think, which is still ongoing in academic circles. Um, as you'll know, Claude Dancy, who became the deputy head of MI6, he was placed in charge of the escape lines for MI6 and MI9. And the reason was that we didn't want the escape lines to overlap. And so he was in charge and sort of pulled the strings. He also uh, was not too favoured by SOE, they're the Special Operations Executive, so they on their own are dropping agents behind enemy lines. A lot of them, of course, that were dropped into France were betrayed, but they are basically carrying out sabotage mm. uh, and acts of resistance behind enemy lines. And MI6, which is functioning sort of quietly, completely undercover, is not really wanting its work to come too close, or should I say the SOE work to come too close. Noise, blowing up stuff right close to secret operations is not a good idea. So there was an attempt to keep all these lines <clears throat> separate and rivalry certainly between, I think certainly between SOE and MI6, I think the boundaries between MI9 and MI6 are a little bit more complex and are often blurred. Mm. As an aside, you might actually say that, um, of course, Churchill famously cho chose um, uh, uh, ordered uh, Hugh Dalton as the head of Department of Economic Warfare to set Europe ablaze. That you might say that this strategy might almost be counterproductive if what you're really seeking to do is to gather useful, use, useful intelligence. Um, but I, I guess yeah. that's sort of the, the, the tension that you have in, in, in British strategy at, at that, that, that particular time. Well, you've mentioned some uh, already some, some interesting characters like, like Claude Dancy, but a, a few others which I, I, I noticed. Um, Clayton Hutton, Jimmy Langley uh, and, and Varian Fry. I, ga I gather Varian Fry isn't your great uncle or anything like that. But uh, No, no relative. No relative. So can, can you just say something about, about these, these, these key players? So to Ferry and Fry, first of all, yeah, this is a new story. Uh, Ferry and Fry was an American. He'd been working for a publishing house in America. And Eleanor Roosevelt, wife of the president, had a special list on which she had the names of 200 Jews that she wanted rescued, very prominent Jews. In fact, Ferry and Fry went on to say, for example, the famous painter Marc Chagall. And so he volunteered effectively to go on Eleanor Roosevelt's special mission. So he was sent to the south of France, he was sent to Marseille and when he gets there he's got like three thousand dollars strapped to his to his legs so and no one <laughs> no one can pick him up in the you know and he's flying over anyway he, he arrives in Marseille and he discovers so he's got to find these 200 Jews and bring them out through secret routes over well primarily over the Pyrenees uh, into Spain but when he gets there he finds hundreds of other Jews all and some political Nazi polit sorry and some political anti-Nazis that all need rescuing. So he's a bit stuck. So he goes to the American embassy and they don't want to know. They don't want to have anything to do with this. So he thinks at one point, ah, oh, what about the British? So <laughs> he goes to visit a, a chap called Major Tor in Madrid. And what he doesn't know is Major Tor is working for MI6. And they soon very quickly, the British, they realize at the embassy that Varian Fry has gathered a whole network of forgers, guides that can get or Jews out of Europe. But they're thinking, hang on a minute, our 5,000 airmen, uh, soldiers and airmen that are trapped, we can get some of them out. And so interestingly, the twist is that Varian Fry ends up becoming a secret agent for MI6 for a short period of time. And he said, I'll do it for you as long as you don't tell the Americans, which of course they didn't. And in return, he got a fair stash of money from us British to help all of his efforts, to help get Jews out as well. So very interesting story. And the other one you mentioned, uh, uh, um, Jimmy Clayton, Langley. Uh, Jimmy Langley. Yeah, so you mentioned Jimmy Langley. People probably heard of him. His legacy in MI9 is huge. He'd been trapped uh, after Dunkirk and been injured uh, and taken to a hospital. But eventually he does escape uh, and makes his way back to England. And that's where he's, he has a pretty senior role in MI9, eventually heading room 900. And his father, interestingly, 
Frederick Langley, had worked for Claude Dancy in World War I in intelligence. So it's very interesting how your stories come full circle. And so Dancy was keen to get him on board for intelligence duties because Langley had been injured. He'd had to have his left arm amputated. Mm -hmm. And so he couldn't fight again. But there was a very important role for him in military intelligence. And so he makes a huge contribution through the wartime, uh, deeply embedded in MI9's work. And Clayton Hutton, he's the sort of the, uh, the head toy maker, as, as it were. Is that right? Yeah, I love Clayton Hutton. He's a sort of, well, can you call him the boffin, the British inventor? Because MI9 needed to send, we all know about these gadgets and stuff, the James Bond gadgets. But of course, those James Bond stories that Fleming created, I was quite naive, really. And a few years ago, when I started on all this kind of stuff, I started to read some of these gadgets in the files. And I'm thinking, well, I thought Fleming had invented these, <laughs> but he actually hadn't. And he had worked for naval intelligence in the wartime, attached to all this stuff, to MI9. So he's sort of drawing on real stuff. And of course, what MI9 needed was to get escape devices into prisoner of war camps. And they were looking for somebody that could make them, for example, design a miniature compass that would work and that you could hide inside ordinary objects. And Clayton Hutton was, was the one. And he was, he'd been fascinated by the likes of Houdini, the escape, escapologist. So um, yeah, he had an interview at the war office. They said to him, tell us about yourself. He said, well, I'm fascinated by escapology. And then that was it. It was so unorthodox. <laughs> they thought, ah, oh, he could probably be useful. And so he went on to design a lot of and procure with another chap, Charles Fraser Smith, uh, a lot of these gadgets and they became vital to survival. I mean, particularly the escape kit, which is a little box with all sorts of essentials mm. for airmen and soldiers to survive behind enemy lines. Right, well, through, through reading your book, I think I've also seen some of these, um, uh, there, was, there was an exhibition at the Imperial War Museum a few years ago. Mm. Things like um, a compass, which is concealed inside a, a button on a uniform and, and you unscrew the bottom of a shaving brush and put a compass in that and money uh, put inside monopoly balls which are sent out for recreation for, for, for the prisoners. But all, all this fascinating stuff, but what really fascinated me, how did the prisoners in Colditz or Stalag Luft Three or whatever it happened to be, how did they know where to look? Well, sometimes in their training, because one of the things MI9 had the foresight was before Allied personnel went into action, uh, they had a three week training course at a special intelligence school in all sorts of aspects of how to escape. But also there were MI9 would send coded messages into the camps and that would give some warning to the prisoners what to look for. Well, you, 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 there's obviously a story to be told how the Allies got these messages into the camps. Now, uh, I, I seem to, uh, to, to, to gather from your book, some of it's uh, broadcast over the radio and some of it's through, through letters. So uh, uh, letters which, which contain codes. Is, is, is that right? Yeah, sometimes you're quite right. There was um, a priest, a padre, who would uh, broadcast messages which had code in them. But also we would engage uh, fictitious relatives to write to prisoners in the camp. Uh, one example actually is very, very clever. One of the prisoners wrote back to MI9 saying, well, just wrote back to his fictitious relatives saying, you know, the weather's good here, the food's quite good, not bad. It's like home from home. And from that phrase, it's like home from home. It was a coded way of saying they've got hidden microphones here, just like we're using on prisoners in Britain. But they would also literally code words and prisoners would learn code before they went into action. And, and or they would have somebody in the camp that could do that. Uh, and then they would would work on the letters and decode and it would work along so many letters after the word the for example and the way the date was written could indicate to a prisoner and the way it was signed whether the letter had anything coded in it or not. 
it's all fascinating, but actually something that just struck me is um, how little of this seems to have gone into mainstream writing about the Royal Air Force in the Second World War. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I, I'm, one, of my, one of my big things as a historian is that different branches of the, um, of the discipline ought to, ought to talk to each other more. So I think, you know, sort of operational air power historians or like me as a sort of land warfare historian ought to talk to intelligence historians a bit more and, and vice versa. I think, you know, it, make, it makes it for a, a much more, 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 more rounded picture. OK, now. Um, We'll put escapes on hold for a moment because I think we've got some questions from uh, uh, from um, members of the um, pe people who, 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 who have given us some cut, cut this bit out again. Um, cut this bit out. Um, we'll put um, escapes on on hold for a moment because we've got some questions from other people, um, which I'll, 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 I'll give give you in a little, little while. Let's talk about how the escape lines ran. So, mm -hmm. so the famous ones like like the Comet line. Dealing, you know, so, so in other words, you've got MI9 dealing with people in occupied countries in Belgium and France and so on. How were these created? How, how did they work? Well, if you look at the Comet Line, which ran from Brussels via Paris, which I love right under the noses of the Nazis, down to the Pyrenees and out uh, over the Pyrenees into Bilboa into Spain, uh, MI9 as an organisation I've now discovered was not known to the helpers its name was not known so all that the helpers and the organizers and the the people who ran the escape lines knew was that there was this organization that was dropping supplies supplying them with money agents whatever and in, in the case of the comet line that was actually founded uh, by a group of Belgian people who had been helping some of our soldiers who were in Belgian hospitals and you know they were missing home and a couple of the nurses were saying well you know we'll one of them was Andre, Andre de Jong very famously Dede and she agreed to help them she said well I'll help you get back home and she was in her early 20s mm. and she traveled to the south of France and to the Pyrenees and another Belgian family the de Grief family had already escaped from Belgium I think they may well have been on a wanted list. It's not clear. They were involved in some kind of media stuff. Anyway, they were living along the Pyrenees and Dede linked up with them. And she made the first trip into Spain to the British Embassy with three airmen and said that basically, so with three soldiers, and basically said, you know, I've just trekked across Nazi occupied France with these. And they thought she was a plant, that she was a potential double agent German spy. So she wasn't believed to begin with. And then the embassy messages backwards and forwards to London, realised she was legitimate. And this whole network began what was called the Comet Line. And that's just one example of how, how the line ran. What well, strikes me, think, thinking back to the, uh, the, the classic BBC television series of the early 80s, Secret Army, um, the Jan Francis character, presumably that's based on, on, on Dede, you know, the, the young Belgian girl, yes. early 20s, the rest of it, yeah. Uh, I mean, more generally, I mean, I, 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 I'm assuming you, you, you must have watched this series at, 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 at some stage. Yes. Um, how, how true to life is it? Was it is it um, decent, um, broadly historically accurate? I think it's historically accurate in so far as the the escapes and the antics that the prisoners get up to, particularly you know in Colditz. Uh, one of the criticisms that was made of the program at the time was that some of those that survived said, "Well, you know, we weren't, we didn't look quite so well fed, and so." so healthy but by and large yes because of course the main person that was um consulting for the program was pat reed who himself escaped from cold it's and made it back he escaped in october 1942 so he was the consultant for the program and if you compare what happens in that series which is actually brilliant with the now declassified mi9 files they're incredibly accurate yeah, okay. And, and of course, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Se Secret Army series, of course, uh, confusingly, Bernard Hepton is the German commandant in Colditz. And then he becomes, you know, the, uh, the, the Belgian cafe owner, uh, uh, sort of, sort of the pillar of the, of the escape line in, in, in Secret Army. I mean, that struck me as being, you know, 
pretty true to uh, historical form. I guess, uh, except that in the early 80s, we knew a lot less about what actually happened than we do now, not least the thanks of historians like you who've, who've done the spade work. Well, of course, the files hadn't been declassified. Oh, and course, yeah. I'm not sure if people are aware, you know, a lot of people have read Airy Neve's book Saturday MI9 which is absolutely brilliant and Foot and Langley's book on MI9 and when I was asked to write this book I thought to myself my gosh how can I better those two because they're absolutely brilliant but of course they were writing at a time when the files had not been declassified and so I've been able to build on their work but also to access declassified files which they couldn't. And of course one of the pains is MI6 still haven't declassified files and so there's still a, a bit of a black hole going on there. Yeah I think we'd be lovely to get get inside these MI6 archives but mm. rumour has it that they're not as full as we all think they're full of files but I'm not so sure. Uh, but until... Is it Keith, Keith, Keith Jeffrey who did the, yeah, I remember talking to Keith and I think he hinted as, as, hinted as much. I think uh, bro, uh, branches of the British government have a nasty habit of throwing stuff away that you really really want to keep as historians but there you go. Okay um, now it's uh, we're coming to the end of the bit where we're just having a chat and then I'm going to ch chuck in a few a few questions from other people uh, but the um, the final thing I want, want to ask you directly now it strikes me in fact you you, you actually say this you think the the, the um, the major contribution your book makes towards our knowledge of all this subject is that there is a much, much closer uh, relationship between intelligence gathering and escape and evasion than people have hitherto thought. Mm. So I suppose the, the big question is um, adding together intelligence gathering and helping uh, air crew and soldiers and so on to, to, to escape. What difference did MI9 really make to the outcome of the war? I suppose, put it another way, um, there's a fair investment of resources in MI9. Was the, um, was the return worth that, that large investment? Oh, absolutely. And I think this was something I wasn't expecting when I started out on the research, I was aware of the sheer volume of thousands upon thousands of you know, files right across not just Western Europe, of course, but the Far East, the Middle East and, and the Balkans, etc. and Greece. And I was thinking, you know, how can we contain all of this? And I don't think the analysis, the final word has yet been said. I probably shouldn't say that having just brought out the book. But um, it is true that thousands and thousands of intelligence files the prisoners were interrogated it's a term which MI9 uses but in effect debriefed they made it back they were debriefed so if you look at those escape and evasion reports that survive and are now declassified there's not only information about escaping which can help others and be fed into the MI9 program but they're also being asked about conditions behind enemy lines things that they might have spotted so for example they might have come out through a particular port Danzig or something mm. and they would say well by the way the searchlights are on this side but this side there's a such and such so MI9 got intelligence like that but it went far beyond that they are also interrogating agents and uh, leaders of the line that had to be brought out because when the lines were compromised some of the leaders comet line we've mentioned or the pat line had to be brought out uh, and they were debriefed but beyond that for the very first time I also uncovered that this mysterious room 900 was actually involved in intelligence gathering on enemy agents enemy spies German agents and spies on a par with MI6 and that for me is one of the, the major breakthroughs. The MI9 has combined escape and evasion work with intelligence gathering. And as its official history says in the files, declassified files, this was something wholly new that we'd not done in the First World War. We've not combined those two. And so I think just finally to say really that in terms of intelligence gathering, I think we are just at the beginning of understanding the sheer volume 
of MI9's contribution and what it needs is for historians like us to start looking at these files and the impact on various aspects of the war, quite aside from escape and evasion. Mm. Thank you, that, 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 that's really interesting. Um, um, for, for those people who are not in the know, um, I can't remember who said it, but someone said that intelligence is the missing dimension of history. And it's true. Uh, and and for, for both world wars, a lot of really good stuff has come out in recent years by people doing the patient, very painstaking spade work. So for example, Jim Beach's work on British yes. intelligence in the First World War. In a, in a similar fashion. And of course also intelligence. I think the problem is, you know, we tend to think James Bond and spies and that sort of stuff, but much intelligence is very mundane. Um, it's building up a picture of, as you should say, you know, whether a, a searchlight is a different part of a port, a port or not. But all of this stuff is really important and goes, has to be, to, be, to, to be pieced together. And then of course, it's a matter of interpreting the information mm. that you've got, which is, a, which is a, a, another, another part of the story, which we won't go on to today. But I must say, I um, really enjoyed reading your book and I thought it, it makes a genuine contribution to understanding how important MI9 was in, in, um, in the British intelligence effort. And um, um, no book is definitive, uh, but I must say, You've, I, must, I think you, you've moved forward the, the debate a huge amount with this book. And I, I think, um, well, I certainly think the, um, the book deserves to be taken very, very seriously for, for, for that reason. Okay, well, there's got a few, a few questions that various people have, uh, have, have sent in. Start with a um, question, uh, a nice easy one to start with, a question from Mike, who is part of the, uh, the, the Wantage Literary, Literary Festival um, gang. Uh, why, why are there three witches on the MI9 patch? Is this a reference to, uh, to Cawdor and, the, um, and Macbeth and all the rest of it? Oh yeah, this is the, the badge, three witches on broomstick, which I love, you know. If we didn't have the jacket cover we've got, I'd have loved that of the jacket cover <laughs> uh, of the book. But yeah, three witches on broomsticks. And this wasn't, this was used from 1944 for very, very secret operations over Holland, um, Operation Blackmail it's called, and I talk about that in the book. And yeah, I just love the imagery. It's, I personally believe it's harking back to Macbeth, you know, uh, toil and trouble for the Nazis, the witches in Macbeth. It, it's not proven, we don't know for sure, but that's, that's my uh, take on it. Well, I'll leave that one for the cultural historians, the influence of Shakespeare on intelligence in, in, the, uh, in, in the Second World War. Okay, the second question, this is from Andy Cockrum, who's the um, chairman of the British Modern Military History Society. He's, he's, uh, he's asked a few questions, but one I thought was particularly interesting was, um, were there any specific incidents when MI9 operations were seriously compromised by betrayal or German inf infiltration? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, to give you one example, in France, there's a very famous betrayer known as Harold Cole. He was British. And when I was writing this stuff, I was struggling to understand why one will betray one's country. But of course, he does it for a number of reasons, in his case, for money. And with devastating effect, because he was actually taken in by the helpers and guides, um, particularly um, the Comet Line. And he would bring sort of fake American airmen or, or any um, allied airmen and pretend that they were genuine. And of course, that's how some of the network went down. And when it went down, it went down with devastating consequences, particularly in 1942. And it was always a concern as to how and whether this would ever recover. I mean, the Comet Line did recover. Um, but it was, you know, when you think about the mileage across Nazi-occupied Europe, mm. at somewhere it was always a risk that the lines could be betrayed. Um, following up from that, um, are there any ob obvious examples of where, uh, specific examples of where MI9's stuff or information sent into the camps helped with, 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 with an escape. So, so did it have a bearing on, on, on the greatest escape from Stalag Luft III in 1944, for example? 
Well, do you mean the escape devices or do you That's mean... right, escape devices or, or, or information that was sent in by MI9. Just sort of trying to pin down a specific example of, you know, MI9 yeah. facilitated that escape. Yeah, I mean, primarily it's sending in, it kind of doesn't seem like an obvious trail, but sending in um, ordinary items that could be used by the prison. So what MI9 relied on was prisoner ingenuity as well. Mm -hmm. They all had to be Christopher Clayton Hutton's in their own right. So that um, MI9 would send in stuff in parcels, there would be no MI9 stuff in Red Cross parcels, but for example, the boxes, um, famously, people may remember the wooden glider that was made at Colditz was made from boxes, either Red Cross boxes or boxes that the um, boxes which MI9 sent in. So prisoners were allowed blankets for extra warmth uh, in the camps. So MI9 would send blankets into the camps. And interestingly, they'd got a sort of pattern on the blankets that you couldn't see, but the prisoners knew that if you dipped it in a bucket of water, pattern would come up, which they could cut around and make into a German uniform for escape. So it's things like that, that enable prisoners to escape and sending in any um, items that prisoners could use, whether it's paints, uh, things which they could use to fake medals. I just love the ingenuity mm -hmm. <laughs> of the prisoners. As I said, MI9 said, if it moves, nick it. So they had to pinch whatever they could in the camp to make into whatever they wanted. It's a bit like Boy Scouts. Mm. Um, now, a question from... Uh, uh, Dr. Linda Parker, who's who's uh, another uh, uh, Wantage res re resident and, and uh, frequent speaker at the Wantage Literary Festival. Uh, Linda asks, um, would you agree with Michael Foote, as MRD Foote, the, uh, the, the historian rather than Michael Foote, the politician, yes. that, that intelligence officers in large camps in Germany realised that their most useful task was to exploit their position as observers on enemy soil? Would, 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 you, would you agree, agree with MRD Foote's um, uh, statement? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a sort of precursor, really, to what I've discovered about MI9 as an escape. Sorry, not. It's a precursor to what I've discovered as MI9 as an intelligence gathering organisation, because every camp had an appointed intelligence officer. And one of the things that prisoners knew that if they were going out on a, on a work assignment, if the guards had got them going out on a work assignment, or supposing they were going to, to, had to go to the hospital or anywhere where they went outside the camp, they were asked to observe any slight detail which could help in a future escape. Mm -hmm. And then they would, once they were back inside the camp, they would report back on some of the things that they'd seen. So yeah, the intelligence is really going on uh, all the time. Um, one final question, then, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll ask another one. And uh, this is from, from, from Vicky of, of the uh, Wantage Literary Festival um, headquarters, as it were. She says, well, how were MI9 able to maintain secrecy since they were based on the floor of a London hotel, the, the, the Metropole? Uh, so in other words, how did they manage to keep the existence of such organisations secret, given they had to operate, in a, you know, at least on the surface, in a, very, a fairly obvious way? Well, yeah, because they were in the war office building. But I suppose you could say, as luck would have it, I'm not quite sure if a bomb falling on the corner of the building is described as luck, but Norman Crockett, the head of MI9, decided it was time to move out of central London, and he moved MI9 headquarters to Wilson Park, which, is, which was in Beaconsfield in Buckinghamshire. It's not to be confused with an, another place of, a, of the same name elsewhere, but uh, it is now a, a development site. But yeah, he moved it out their special camp hidden in the trees and so it was very very secret and it was said that Clayton Hutton had his own little sort of hut or bunker there where out of the way of prying eyes he could just develop his unorthodox warfare so yeah it was a very very secret site well I used to visit Wilton Park when it was still an MOD property fairly regularly because my first academic post was a lecturer at Sandhurst and the, uh, the army had the Marty named Army School of Education there, as though you do anything else at a school apart from educate people. 
but, but, but there you go. But I, I didn't realise the, um, um, the, the connection. My, my final question, well, point rather question, uh, well, point, point out and, and, and a question. We've been talking almost exclusively about officers. Mm. Um, Paul McKenzie's book, The Coldit Smith, published 15 odd years ago, made it clear that actually for ordinary uh, soldiers, certainly, who were taken prisoner, they didn't spend their time planning to escape from prison of war camps. They were working in mines, in factories, on fields, and think, 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 things like that. So, presumably, what you've been talking about is directed largely at officers, or I guess um, sergeant pilots and NCO aircrew, but it's largely an officers, uh, uh, aimed officers, I, I presume. Well, no, I think, you know, MI9 trained personnel of all ranks not just officer class if you like uh, and there was this whole escape mindedness was right across the services and mi9 although it's a branch of military intelligence and we kind of think of it as being like perhaps army it is tri services or mm -hmm. was tri services and what we mean by that of course as you, as you know is army air and naval so um it included fleet air arm navy commandos they all had training whatever rank because they all had a part to play to come back and to use jimmy langley's phrase to fight again and that was the philosophy mm. so no distinction everyone had to have it in their kind of mindset to escape or evade ah. well thank you very much helen that's really brilliant it's been fascinating talking to you uh, if I can just once again, uh, um, well, Helen has called, carefully placed her book behind her shoulder. You can see that. But the book is MI9, um, History of the Secret Service for Escape and Evasion in World War II, uh, published very shortly by Yale University Press. And I would thoroughly recommend it. Uh, a really good read, fascinating and cutting edge research. Um, I can, uh, if, if I can just say that the, uh, for people who are local to, to Wantage, it's available from Mad Hatter's bookshop, but also, of course, many other bookshops, and we would encourage you to use independent ones if you possibly can. Um, if anybody would like to make a donation to the Wantage Liter Literary Festival, um, I'd invite you to go to the festival website, wantageliteraryfestival.co.uk. Uh, we're hoping to be back um, live and um, face to face in 2021 and I've also been prompted by Vicky to, to remind people that I actually had a book which I talked about at last year's literary festival uh, in Hague's shadow letters of Field Marshal uh, Major General Hugo Dupree and Field Marshal Sir Douglas Hague there is actually a tenuous connection with this because one of the people I talk about is John Dupree who uh, was killed trying to escape from a German prison camp in 19, 1942. Point being that, just, a, just, just to reinforce Hel Helen's point, once you were taken prisoner, that was not a case of, for you the war is over, is the cliche. Actually, a different sort of war began. But Helen, thanks very much. Terrific talk, wonderful book. Thank you very much for uh, agreeing to appear at the Wantage Literary Festival. Thank you very much. Thank you, my pleasure.